Okay, I'm just going to introduce our next speaker while he's setting up his HDMI. Our next speaker is uh, Balint. I think he does not require an introduction. He is a director of threat research at Bastille Cybersecurity, um, but also a longtime SDR aficionado and also the organizer or one of the organizers of the Cyber Spectrum, which I would like to remind everyone is Thursday evening uh, um, at Qualcomm. So tomorrow night, 6.30 at Qualcomm. Do you have all the speakers lined up, Balin? Uh, yeah, we, I mean, we have most of them. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to leave it all to you, Balin. And just, just a quick reminder, we have three talks now before the lunch break. Um, yeah. Um, okay, and we are requested to do a sound check. Do you have your mic clipped on? Oh, yeah, you have. Okay. Test one, two. Test one, two. Can you give us a thumbs up? Test one, two. Okay, great. Balance here by everyone. Thanks, Martin. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. I'm just trying to figure out my uh, display situation here. I want to turn mirroring off. Ah, they've changed it to the latest version of a Mac OS. All right, that's good. Okay. And let's pop that as open. All right. The horror. <laughs> the horror. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming back from your break to uh, hear this talk. My name is Balan Sieber. Thank you for the introduction, Martin. I'm the Director of Vulnerability Research at Bastille. And uh, today I'd like to show you some interesting things I've just been working on in my spare time with GNU Radio. Um, it's going to be pretty fast paced. so. Uh, I'll, I'll hopefully try and break everything down and, and move through a, a couple of different topics. So I'd like to talk today about a radar, two types of radar, FMCW and passive, and also uh, drone FPV video decoding. And it's all, of course, using GNU Radio. So the first topic, by the way, um, if as I go through, people have any questions, feel free to shout it out. Um, if it's something small or quick, it, it might actually work better. Um, so just to recap, what I'm going to do is talk about a little bit of theory. Many of you probably know it, but just, just a bit of a premise so everyone gets up to speed. Um, with radar, the idea is that you usually send out some sort of a pulse, and then it's going, that radio energy will reflect off a target and then return to you, return to the antenna, which may or may not be co-located with the transmitter. And then you process that return energy to produce some sort of map or plot. And then after a fixed period of time, which is defined by the PRF, pulse repetition frequency, you transmit another uh, uh, pulse. Um, what's important here is range uh, is defined by the round trip time. So how long it actually takes that RF energy to travel from the transmitter, reflect off the object, and come back to the receiver. Um, we're talking about the speed of light in the RF case, so it'll move very quickly. There's also the notion of ambiguous and unambiguous ranges and velocities. So if you look at this diagram here, with A, you've got the return that's happening in between those two transmitted pulses, so that's an unambiguous return. But an ambiguous range can occur when you get a return from something that exceeded your, um, w w what was defined by your pulse repetition frequency. So in B, you actually had a target further away, uh, but the system will c actually think that it's, it's close because it, it looks like it's a return from the second pulse and not the first transmitted pulse. So just some things to keep in the back of your head. FMCW is a very popular type of radar uh, waveform. It's a frequency modulated carrier wave, and it's essentially defined by a chirp. A chirp is either uh, a frequency that increases or decreases with time. And um, it can run as a full duty cycle. It doesn't have to be just transmitted and then you switch to receive. It can be transmitting all the time. Um, and in this case, we want to think about a chirp like a match filter. Um, so you can create a chirp using a VCO, but you can also just define a chirp and use that to correlate 
transmit and then correlate your returns. Um, and it's great because it has this very strong self-correlation property. Um, so I'm going to switch back and forth between some demos to illustrate what I'm talking about in GNU Radio. Uh, the first thing is actually just showing what that looks like. I'm about to play audio through my laptop, so hopefully that'll come through the, the speakers. Um, I've got it plugged in, but I'm not hearing anything out of the... Oh, there we go. So, unfortunately, I can't see very well. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm actually using a flow graph to generate a chirp, and I'm transmitting that out from the, uh, the laptop, and it's being received, the, that waterfall is being received by the, the microphone in the laptop itself. So as I speak, you can see, obviously, uh, the, the audio on the waterfall, plus the chirp, which ends up as a linear, linear thing. Can I have some whistles, please? So there you go, it's working. Uh, hmm. I turn mirroring off, but I can't really manipulate this. What to do? Um, I guess that's not going to work. OK, uh, so you can realize this in GNU Radio using a, that's Wonderful, thank you. That'll, that'll be a big help. You can realize this in... Is that going to rotate anymore? Is that all locked down? OK, thank you very much. That's, that's a big help. Um, you can realize this in GNU Radio using a VCO. So if you use this um, signal source, and you can use a sawtooth wave, and then you connect that into a VCO, that'll generate a nice chirp for you. And what's also nice is that we can change the rate of this chirp. So let's make it run a bit faster. And if you look now on this, we can make it run even faster. If you look on the, uh, the output of the signal generator, you get a nice saw uh, waveform. And then if you look at the output of the VCO, you can see that it is, in fact, changing in frequency. So that's how you generate a chirp uh, in an easy, accessible manner. So let's um, look at how you would use that in, for example, a radar. So you have a, the chirp generator, which is what I just demonstrated, and you would transmit that out, whether through the speakers or whether through um, a software-defined radio. You have your receiver, often in the same radio. I'm, I'm going to do a demonstration here in a moment uh, using RF. And what's nice is that you can take the same output of the chirp generator that you transmitted and also mix that with what you've received, and then you de-chirp the signal. And um, this has the really nice property that essentially it shifts the spectrum so your reflections actually become tones. They're no longer chirps, you, you de-chirp them. And what you can do is when you actually wire up RF plumbing, so this is not in the software or digital domain, you can actually mix out the original chirp, which is great because then you can improve, uh, make better use of the dynamic range on your uh, ADC. So if you were to look at that in the frequency domain as we did, the red is what we transmit, and the echo, the reflection from an object, is in green. And what's nice here is that you uh, express a time delay, that round trip time that we were talking about, as a frequency shift. So once you actually uh, l uh, bring that up in that same flow graph, we can look and see what the spectrum looks like as it gets shifted. So this is the same spectrum, but this is the output of that mixing stage, so the de-chirping. And what you can see is at the same rate at which the chirp is moving through the spectrum in the original plot, now the underlying baseband spectrum is being shifted, and that 
that linear chirp that we saw in the previous waterfall here, right, is now ending up as this straight line, this tone. And so this is now really, really easy to deal with, especially once you take an FFT of the original signal. This, um, you know, it's, it's really, it was always, uh, uh, I was always mystified by it for the longest time, and then, you know, once you actually sit down and learn it, it actually makes sense, and it's a very elegant way to do the signal processing. So obviously, as I'm talking now, my um, voice is getting shifted over, and it's essentially like noise. So that's very helpful. And obviously, if we make this faster, then we're still going to get a tone there, but it, the baseband spectrum is being shifted even quicker. So what happens then after you do chirping is that you end up with a tone, and then you can run it through an FFT. And each one of those bins then relates to no longer a frequency, but time, the round trip time, so that you can deduce where your targets are by what bin they fall in. So if you have, for example, two moving targets, the, the two uh, echoes there, they might be over time changing their position relative to the radar system, and then you might end up with a shape like this. Um, oh, by the way, I should mention that whenever there's that, that um, blue uh, arrow that pops up, that means that it calls for a demo. Uh, this is one that I tried to do last time, and for some reason it failed miserably. Um, so I'm going to try it again. Uh, this is the same thing. I've disconnected the PA from uh, my laptop. And so this is an FMCW radar using the microphone and speakers just on my laptop here. And because the ADC and the, the DAC and the audio card are not synchronized, I'm going to just manually apply an offset here. And if I get some sort of object like this, then you can see how the FFT bin range, uh, that it falls in is actually related to the range. Can anybody tell me why there are those multiple reflections there? You've got the main one, and then you've got some harmonic seemingly. Multiple reflections, that's right. So all sorts of crazy stuff you have to deal with and, and disambiguate there. OK. So what's nice about the range information is that, I mean, it's basically whatever bin it falls in. What happens if you have targets that actually end up in the same bin? How do you disambiguate them? Well, what you can do is you can start to do further DSP. Um, and also, the other problem is that if you have clutter, for example, um, you might have a really, really weak echo that disappears under that uh, clutter or, or the additional noise you have. So you want to be able to see that, and you can do a little bit of extra DSP to, um, to figure that out. And what I will demonstrate is that even when you have the, sorry, the, um, the actual original transmitted chirp that we end up seeing, that was that, that red thick line on the left-hand side, we can even disambiguate multiple targets or a target in that bin that's being essentially uh, blown out. So we want to use the Doppler <coughs> effect. Um, and we know that when an object is moving, uh, RF energy will hit it, strike off it, reflect off it, and it will actually change the phase as it moves uh, toward or away from a transmitter. And what I want to emphasize is it's very important to think about the geometry of your radar setup. So it's not just that you're transmitting, it's going to uh, you're going to strike a ray out to hit the object, and then it's going to come back at you. You might have a bistatic setup where the transmit and receiver are at different locations, and you might have an object that, that, that is not directly traveling uh, toward or away from you. It might be moving at an angle or, um, or uh, any other sort of configuration. And so you have to realize that when you're actually calculating the velocity of the object using the Doppler effect, you have to take into account uh, the the radar configuration as well as the, the real direction of the object because that angular velocity or the tangential velocity might, might um, be very different from what you receive. So just little things to bear in mind. So to illustrate that very briefly, we've got an aeroplane, for example, traveling. Uh, and at any one time, you have a reflection comeback that's, that's very weak. And in this case, the phase difference is zero. But as we begin to move, 
um, you can see that it moves the wave and therefore you get a phase offset. This is assuming that it's moved and the range return is still in the same bin, but you, because the object is moving with some velocity component with respect to the radar, it's going to impart this phase shift relative to the phase that you actually transmitted. And so what ends up happening is over time, the phase that you receive back from that object will slowly be changing. And as we all know, a phase that changes is a rotating phase or on the complex constellation, and that defines a sine wave. So if we take an FFT of all that, then we can deduce the velocity information. So I'm going to show you the same little demo with some velocity information. So this is actually a Doppler plot. The vertical y-axis is the range information, and the x um, or horizontal is Doppler. So I'm going to adjust that delay factor again like so. And um, obviously, at the top there, we're getting the, it's hearing itself. But if I put this back, you can see the multiple reflections. And if I move it, it'll give you velocity information on one side, because I'm moving the object away. And as you bring the object back, it'll move to the other side. And this is actually just the, the SDL syncing GNU radio um, that I've modified to produce RGB color. And um, yeah, so th that's the, the, the fundamental set up there. Um, so what you can do then is you can get your range information from your original FFT, and then you can put it essentially into an interleaver, and then read the columns out and pass that into a second FFT. And then that'll give you your Doppler information uh, for each range bin, which was essentially what we were plotting on that ras raster in, in the previous um, previous demo. Um, now, what I'm going to do is, can I have um, somebody for uh, demonstration purposes, a volunteer, please? Uh, where is my flow graph? Come on, anyone. All you have to do is wave a laptop around. All right. Thank you very much. A round of applause for our volunteer. This is a dream come true, being part of a balanced saber demonstration. <laughs> um, so this will just take a moment of setup. Um, what I've got here is I've got a flow graph. I've got a B200 mini. I've got two directional antennas. Um, ben, if you wouldn't mind coming around this side here on the, on the ground. It's exactly the same setup, but we're doing RF. And because we're talking about the speed of light, obviously the distances here will be so minuscule that we're not going to get any range information outside of the, the actual um, original clutter, which is, uh, which is the, the receiver picking up the transmitter. But because we process phase information, we can actually get phase information out from this little experiment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bump up our transmit gain here. You can see this is uh, the tone that we get after the de-chirping. I'm going to click on this. And then um, I'm going to put this about here, actually. And so you see we've got the same, the same plot. We're not going to get any range information. But um, Ben, would you mind please maybe just standing off to the side and then doing big sweeping motions? Sorry, you can pretend this is, this is the target we're interested in. Obviously, it's just a laptop, but it's got a nice radar cross-section. Um, yeah, so you can see, I mean, it's not fantastic because obviously there's a lot of self-interference, but you can see that that center point, the bright point, is actually moving left and right as, oh no, just to, toward, and, toward and away. Yeah, that's it. There we go. You can see that it's moving left and right based upon that. Now, I've got one other little trick because um, it's always good to, to um, hear what's going on as well. I'm going to just move this fine, where's my fine delay? Is it off the screen? Click, offset fine, here we go. So I'm going to align that um, 
that zero range bin to the very top of this, this um, thing here. Um, do I still have audio coming out of the, the laptop? Huh, that's weird. Did I forget to do something? Oh, there we are. So this is like a sort of Doppler um, musical instrument. You, you can hear the tone rise and tone fall as the object is moved toward or away from the... It need, might need a little bit of tweaking. Give it a bit, bit, more, bit more oomph. Yeah, sorry, I had the volume up a little bit too high. Could you go again, go again. Yeah, so you can hear the tone going up and down. So that's, that's the GNU Radio Doppler theremin for you. Thank you very much, Ben. All right. Um, so you can do the calculations there, and your range resolution for one bin is 150 meters, so obviously we're not going to fall into another bin, but the Vmax, which is the maximum Doppler you can resolve, is plus minus five meters per second, which we're doing quite nicely. So where can you apply this? CODAR is an HF system used to map ocean currents. It can be deployed around the ocean, and you can go online and see these maps and see how they uh, use some really fancy DSP to uh, resolve where the ocean currents are moving. This is what the waveform actually looks like. And um, to actually see and hear it, it looks like this. So this is a recording. Uh, Ian Buckley and I went up to Skyline Boulevard and um, made some recordings. And they look like these chirps on the HF spectrum. And you can see there are actually quite a lot of them. And if you use upper sideband, then it sounds like a chirp. Um, why is this cool? Well, we can also use it to map the ionosphere. We know that uh, HF signals will bounce off various layers. Um, this is the setup we had. We had uh, N210, GPSDO, USERP, we recorded that. Uh, just had a long wire or a simple dipole. And you can throw that into GNU radio, do that same de-chirping, and then do an FFT here. I did the FFT in board line. You can see that you have what's likely the ocean reflections at the very bottom of the display. And then everything above that in distance is the virtual range uh, from the various layers of the ionosphere as they change over time. And this is cool because you're using somebody else's transmitter to map a dynamic part of the Earth. Um, other people have done this with great success too. Guha was up here talking a few years ago hijacking other ionosons, but the point is it's really, really easy to do, and literally that's the down conversion part. It's just you generate a, the signal source that's synchronized to their transmitter, use the VCO again and down convert, and then you're done. Um, so what's nice then is that you can create the same kind of plot. This is sped up, and this is the, the range Doppler plot of the ionosphere essentially. So you've got the ocean on the left, and all that kind of the streak, vertical streaks and bands there end up being um, the ionosphere. Another cool thing you can do is using ATSC, using the uh, uh, pseudo noise synchronization sequence, uh, gives you a PRF of about 41 hertz, range of resolution 28 meters, plus or uh, minus five meters per second Doppler. I originally had this set up in my attic, trying to pick up specular reflections off these cars uh, on the highway. Um, and then, you know, there were, you can see there those little reflections moving around. I'm pretty sure they were the, the cars. Um, and with that range and velocity, you can expect that, you know, given the geometry, that was probably uh, reasonable. Um, the other thing that I should mention is in terms of ambiguous uh, Doppler, uh, because you're doing an FFT, you can alias. So if your velocity exceeds the maximum unambiguous bounds, then you're just going to wrap back in. That's an important thing to remember. So where do you go from there? Well, you go to the airport. We've got planes coming in on approach to SFO. We found a nice little spot. Ian and I went down there, and um, they got in a little car park. We pulled up there, set up a TV antenna, and the planes are flying overhead on approach, running the software. Um, 
I've already spoken about all that. That's just remembering, remembering geometry. So you have to pick your uh, TV station, remember where your, your target is, where your receiver is, and then you know, these are all the TV stations in the area, so you can experiment with the geometry to see what gives you the best result. Um, and we were pleasantly surprised that uh, you can actually resolve things. So have a look at that streak, diagonal streak coming in from the right. There it is moving toward the center. Can everybody see, see the diagonal streak moving? That's actually a plane coming in and the velocity with respect to the transmitter and receiver is, uh, is changing and it's wrapping around because it's moving so fast. And the distance to the receiver is closing in because obviously it's traveling toward us. So that was neat. Um, and if you look sort of at the bottom, there are those bright spots. This was actually a plane on the other side of the bay that was coming in on approach to Oakland. Um, well, what's the next step? Well, we, the problem is we forgot about actually recording the planes as this was happening, because I might have just generated that from a completely different scenario. So yesterday, we went out to a little park by San Diego International Airport, really nice, uh, close position, close to the runway. Again, all about geometry. Phil Kahn was nice enough to let me know that some TV transmitters were up there. Um, and we went down and sort of did an initial spot check and took the gear. Um, you know, we saw planes flying. Unfortunately, I, this is, it requires a GPS DO so you can get a good synchronization with the uh, TV transmitter. Unfortunately, I left the GPS antenna back at the hotel. Um, so it kind of still worked, but, but it would have been nicer to have it. Um, the real kicker was when only at the very end did I realize that I was actually playing back from a file source and not using the user. <laughs> I was working on it on the plane, and I just forgot about it. We were so excited, and things, you know, things were moving quickly. Um, so we went back in the evening. Nick Foster joined us then. Nick was kind enough to be the tripod. And uh, you can see we, we had some nice takeoffs there. I'll attempt to do a sort of picture-in-picture -picture mode here. Um, if you look at the streaks now, it's going to be in the opposite direction because the aircraft will be moving away from us. You can see the streak wrapping around really quickly because the aircraft is moving at very high velocity. And then as the geometry changes, you can see that the wrapping slows down, but the distance increases. And um, Ian was nice enough to shoot some cool video of that ascending into the clouds. One more of that so you can get a, a feel for what's going on. We just used directional antennas and kept pointing it at the, uh, at the aircraft. Luckily, no police turned up. And so you can see that streak happening there as it, as it moves across the, uh, the range. And what's really interesting is that central band, just to hammer the point home, that central band is always there due in, in like the zero Doppler uh, bin because, you know, ATSC, you have multipath and you're going to get stronger responses. That aircraft response that you saw in there was so incredibly weak. The only way you would be able to resolve that is through that Doppler processing. That's why it's so incredibly powerful. Now, um, I am sped this up at 10 speed, and you can see there are all sorts of interesting objects flying around. There's one takeoff, and there are all these other little bright spots moving around, which are aircraft uh, further away. Uh, and, and that was you know, obviously obscured by clouds, so we wouldn't have been able to see it visually, but you can use just you know, someone else's TV station to illuminate these birds. Okay, last topic to wrap up, FPV. Um, we know that uh, analog video gives you really low latency. I thought it'd be cool to try to decode this with GNU radio. The signal's in the 5.8 gigahertz band. I went out to a drone meetup and recorded some of the, the spectrum. I saw this, zoomed in, uh, sorry, rotated, looked like that, zoomed in. Can anybody tell me what this could be? NTSC video. What's curious is that is when you look at it on the waterfall, it actually looks like the uh, the normal, um, you know, uh, floating point, uh, not complex, sample stream. So what it is is they, they actually take NTSC, they FM, a frequency modulate it, and then put it on the spectrum. So with normal NTSC, you know, broadcasting, it's NTSC on AM vestigial sideband, and a separate audio subcarrier, etc. But this is just video over FM. Um, now, this is the sort of common waveform. You have your horizontal sync, a color burst, and then your um, scan line. Um, lots of you know, numbers and funny names to go with. You've got the front porch, you've got the back porch, you've got the, the vertical sync, the horizontal sync, the blank period, the breezeway. Pretty, pretty funny. They must have had good fun coming up with this, with this stuff. Um, and most importantly, it gives you calibration levels so that when you actually get to your picture information, that's, that's scaled correctly. You see that you have the... Um, 
the sync there at the beginning, and then you have a whole bunch of scan lines, and then you have the vertical sync at the beginning, and then you have the entire field. So I made a really simple decoder. It's luminance only. I use a match filter for the vertical sync. I read out a fixed number of samples that go into, goes into the raster plot, into the SDL sync. Um, now, because the clocks are all slightly off, I use a, a dynamic resampler, and there's an extra block to handle the odd and even fields. Um, this is a very simple, uh, t the, the taps literally plotted that you use with the filter, and um, the rate matching is done by using a peak detector on the output of the filter that goes into a DPLL block that tracks it, and then it goes into this rate synchronizer that um, throws out garbage values and sort of uh, you know, average th averages things until you lock and then, and then feeds the messages into the resampler so that you end up having the, the appropriate rate coming in. Unfortunately, that's what it looked like. And I was tearing my hair out, couldn't figure out what was going on. Ha has anybody seen an image similar to this? No? When you yeah, maybe. What about if you've been um, mixing and matching your uh, mixing and matching? Oops. Mixing and matching your um, regions. So somebody said it. So I went. I went back. I should have done this a lot sooner. I measured the, uh, the duration there of one uh, scan line, and you can see the 50 there. It doesn't say 60, so it is actually PAL. Um, now, the frame structure is really interesting because obviously this is uh, interlaced format, so you get the total number of lines, but you read out one field, and then you read out the next field, even fields, odd fields. But the, the second field starts halfway through the end of the, the first field. So there's an extra block that handles the detection of the field and then padding out the raster block because it's got to be a fixed number of, of, um, of uh, samples that get translated. Now, this is analog, remember, so it's just literally you're turning, um, you're turning your um, bits on the air, that those analog values into a scaled value between uh, 0 and 255. So where's our FPV flow graph? Here we go. Uh, so this is just playing back from the recording. Um, and so it establishes a nice lock. And it's also kind of nice because you can see all the interference coming in. The filter still works. It still maintains the, the rate and the lock. And you, know, you get a nice picture. Um, this, interestingly, this had no color burst, so they were actually transmitting monochrome. Um, and you can visualize things very uh, nicely in here. For example, the vertical sync, you can see there ends, and then the field is determined by whether or not the um, blank period happens uh, early or late after that initial sync. You can see the odd and even changing very quickly, and the output of the peak detector looks like this. Um, I had to sort of write a custom peak detector to handle handle you know, various, various parameters, and it would, it would find the right peak, and it had a look ahead, and so on. Um, the final thing here is the, the, determining the field. This is kind of neat in that um, you have two filters that are matched with the even and odd filter at that particular point. And as they change, and it triggers reading out the scan line, it basically sees whether the output of one filter is greater than the other filter, and then it determines if it's an even or an odd field, and then you know, uh, outputs the picture appropriately. Now. To prove that this can actually, uh, and this is my very final thing, w all work and, and happen in real time. Actually, apparently there is a signal being transmitted here in the audience. I'm going to attempt to receive it. Um, and I hope that I still have audio from the laptop as well. Uh, and I'm going to bring over my video window here. <laughs> Now, who can tell me why the image looks a little bit funny? See how it's got that pattern, that sort of stippled pattern running through it? Yeah? You're absolutely right, Skylar. So the reason um, why that, that happens is you can actually see on the side here, you've got the, 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 um, the blanking period for the, the horizontal scan line, and then you've got the color burst, which is actually being rendered there. And Old TVs 
um, had a low pass filter such that it would actually ignore the color information, so it was backward compatible. And what we can do then is we can actually drop the filter down to about there, and now it looks good again. That's how it, you had backward compatibility with black and white TVs. What's that? <laughs> Decode the color? That's, that's future work. And just to prove it's live, <laughs> Nate, Nate here is actually using a, a transmitter from his drone hooked up to a Raspberry Pi. Please stand up, Nate. And um, thank, you, thank you, Nate. And now to prove it, um, disconnect the power, please. And now you get the good old Detune TV look in GNU Radio. There you go. All right. Um, I think we're out of time, and I'm actually done. So, yeah, Cyber Spectrum, Martin already mentioned that. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're a bit over time, but while the next speaker is setting up their gear, we can probably take a question. Yep. Unless there's none. Oh, okay. There's one here. When you were uh, looking at airplanes, did the FBI... Did the FBI ever come up and take a look at you when you were looking at airplanes? Uh, there was one time when um, a police officer came out because somebody had, I had parked in a residential street and um, there was a guy living in the house next door and I think he'd been watching me for quite some time and he came up with this big black dog and wondered what I was doing and I gave him a truthful answer and he wasn't satisfied and then he called the police and I <laughs> gave that answer to the police a uh, woman and she was fine with it and you know check, checked my name and my license and it was all, all good. So, and it always helps to have a, an amateur radio license with you as well. So if you haven't got a ham license, go to and sit the exam on Friday. If but you don't have a ham radio license after this Friday, you have no excuse. <laughs> Are you ready? Uh, sure, it's the club.